Welcome to my channel. I'm Scott and if you want to catch my newest video, I post one every day. In this video, I am going to walk you through the process of valuing digital turbine stock by analyzing their financial statements and dissecting their financial ratios so we can determine if it's a buy or a sell. Digital Turbine is the middleman between service providers and advertisers who put apps on phones. The company negotiates the rates for app placement with advertisers, collects the money, and then remits about 60% to the service providers and keeps the rest for themselves. AT&T and Verizon are two common service providers. Let's get started with the model. This is a mid-cap company, $4.9 billion market cap. They're trading at $55 a share and they have 89 million shares outstanding. Let's look at the financials. The way you value a company is you estimate the future free cash flows and then you discount that number back to today's value. That's what we're doing in this video. And free cash flow is cash flow from operations minus capital expenditures. So you can see the company has negative free cash flow in 2019, positive in the other years. Net income is a profit and loss on the income statement. It's revenue minus expenses. And they have negative in 2018 and 19, but positive after that. Revenue is a sales for the company, and that more than doubles from 75 million to 167 million. This is the company's income statement. The top line is the revenue, the sales. Below that is the cost of revenue. These are the costs directly related to generating those sales. Then the gross profit is revenue minus cost of revenue and that's growing each year up to $68 million. And that's also growing each year. It was negative in 2018, but now it's $21 million. The company has some debt, so below that is interest payments on their debt, then other income and expenses. And the bottom line of the income statement is the net income. That's the profit and loss, and that was $26 million, double from 2020. And they had negative net income in 2018 and 2019. So they're moving in the right direction. This is the statement of cash flows. The top line is operating cash flow. That's how much cash the company generates from its operational business. This is capital expenditures. These are investments in property, plant, and equipment. Operating cash flow minus CapEx gives you your free cash flow. So it looks like they're really improving their free cash flow. It was pretty low in 2018 and 19. Now it's close to $27 million. Free cash flow is the cash that's left over to grow your business, to pay down debt, to pay a dividend, or to buy back stock. Since this company is so small, they're probably using any excess cash flow to grow the business. They haven't needed much debt to run the business. They did take $20 million in 2020 and $2.5 million in 2018, but that's it. The most important part of any business is their operating cash flow. If you cannot generate positive operating cash flow with your core day-to-day -day business, you don't have much of a business because you cannot rely on debt and equity financing to run your business in the long term. This company is growing their operating cash flow up to $33 million. And the way you calculate operating cash flow, you start with net income that was $26 million. Then you have to add or subtract the non-cash items on the income statement. We have to add back $3.4 million of depreciation, $4.3 million of stock-based compensation. We also have to adjust for changes in working capital. That was negative $3.7 million. So even though they had $26 million of net income, they generated $33 million of cash flow. Remember, net income is accounting profit and loss. It's not actual cash. Let's look at a capital structure. $77 million of equity, $20 million of debt. So they're 80% equity, 20% debt. That's a good balance. And they have negative 2 million of net debt, which means they could pay off all their debt with the cash on a balance sheet and still have $2 million of cash left over. They have a pretty high whack, 20.67%, and that's a discount rate we're gonna to apply to the future cash flows. We estimated four years of future free cash flows. We also estimated a terminal value, which is all cash flows past year of four, that's 5.8 billion. We discounted those numbers back to today using the weighted average cost of capital. We get a value of the company of $3.6 billion. We divide that by 89 million shares. 
and we get a calculated stock price of $41. They're trading at $55, so they're trading at a 34% premium. It's a sell according to the model. Simply Wall Street is a little lower than me. They're at $36 a share. They're also saying the stock is overvalued. As you can tell, I grew their future free cash flows a lot more than the past. I'm basing this off of the average analyst estimate and also what the company's future projections are. Even if the company has this aggressive growth, which they plan to do, I still see the value of the stock not as much as what it's trading at today. But as you know, the market is forward thinking. So it really doesn't matter what the company actually does. It matters what investors feel the company will do. So the stock price could get pushed up to $100,000, $200,000. That doesn't mean it's going to stay up there. So if you think the stock is worth $40 and you buy it and it goes up to $100,000, $200,000, you should probably sell it because if you're correct, the stock price should eventually come down. But nobody knows when it will come down. So it's kind of like going to a casino. I usually don't invest that way, but I know a lot of people that do. I hold for the long term and ride out the bumps along the way because I know the stocks I pick are good stocks. The stock price was flat, close to zero for many years. Then it shot up recently and it's going up like crazy. $55 a share. It was over $60 a share at one point. This company is a really high beta, 2.4, so the stock is really volatile. That's why they had such a high whack. The stock has gone up 600% in the past 52 weeks, obviously a lot more than the S&P 500. The low was 348, the high was 61, and the stock is trading above its 50-day and 200-day moving average. So it's on a major uptrend. About 2.5 to 4 million shares are traded each day for this stock. Of the 88.7 million shares outstanding, 85.5 million are on float, so they're available to investors like me and you to purchase. About two-thirds of the shares are held by institutions, and almost 5% of the shares are shorted. If you invested $10,000 into this company 10 years ago and held till today, you'd have $1.8 million today. Almost nobody would have invested $10,000 into this company 10 years ago, and if they did, they would have probably sold right away when it hit twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000. And even if you did invest $10,000 and it hit thirty dollars and you held on, then it came back down to like seven or 8000 you would have been really upset. And then once it hit ten again, you probably would have sold out to get your money back. Not many people would just hold on, except if you own the company, that is. And even then, I'm not sure if you would have held on. FMR is the biggest shareholder at 12%, then BlackRock, Vanguard, D.E. Shaw, and State Street. Let's look at their financial ratios. The average P.E. in the entire market is 11.9. The median is 14.8. P.E. is stock price over earnings per share. To calculate earnings per share, that's net income over shares outstanding. They're at 191, so investors are paying $191 for $1 of earnings. So obviously the earnings are really low relative to the stock price. Price to sales is stock price over sales per share. They're at 29.3, also not such a great ratio. Price to book is stock price over book value per share. They're at 63.3. And the way you calculate book value per share, it's equity over shares outstanding. Equity is assets minus liabilities in the balance sheet, and they have $77 million of equity. But they have negative $36 million of tangible equity because they have $113 million of intangible assets on their balance sheet. ROE is net income over equity. They have a really good ROE at 33%. Current ratio is current assets over current liabilities. They can only cover 70% of their current liabilities with their current assets. And their current assets are 21 million of cash, 33 million of receivables, and 3.7 million of prepaid assets. And the company will probably need more debt to run their business over the next 12 months. They did have positive 27 million of free cash flow but negative 24 million of working capital. Plus they should need more money to grow their business or maybe acquire another company. The best way to look at ratios to compare them to similar companies, I've done videos of 23 companies in the same industry as digital. And if digital has a number in red, they're worse than the average. If they have a number in green, they're better than the average. So they're worse in all the price multiples. They have a weak current ratio. They do have a good ROE. A lot of these companies are negative. 
and so they have a positive ROE because they have positive earnings. They are lower in debt than the average, and they're a pretty small company, 4.9 billion market cap. And most companies in this industry do not pay a dividend, and they don't either. So to summarize, I do have them trading at a 34% premium, but nobody really knows how a stock will perform. If you're in this for a quick flip, you could definitely make some money. Of course, you can lose money as well, but I do not feel it's a good long-term investment unless you're really confident about this company. But it is exciting how much they're growing. It's also good to see they have positive equity and they're not using too much debt to run their business. So let me know what you think. Give this video a like, subscribe, or comment below. Also, if you'd like to get a custom valuation or just support the channel, you can become a member by clicking on the link in the description below. Thanks for watching.